Well, welcome back to another episode of the Addy Hour. As always, I'm just honored to be able to host these conversations. As you'll notice in these recent conversations, we're bringing in some different types of topics, want to kind of keep things fresh and relevant, but also just get at the heart of really some important issues. So today we're jumping in and talking about black bodies and race in art and society. And I have two wonderful guests who I think you all are really going to enjoy hearing from. They already had some good uh, chemistry together off camera, offline. So I'm actually really curious to see where this conversation is going to go today uh, with this important topic. But by way of introduction, I'm going to go ahead first and introduce Daniel Swan. Daniel is an assistant professor of sociology at Goucher College. He completed his doctorate in sociology at the University of Maryland, and then also before that earned his undergrad degree at Rutgers. He's taught a whole host of courses, including courses on comparative social media, Generation Z, race and ethnic relations, social movements, wealth, power, and prestige, and also data analytics, so a wide range of topics. He also has academic interests in race, atheism, and religion, and political sociology and social psychology. He's the author of some books, has also contributed to some book chapters. One book I wanted to highlight is his qualitative study of Black atheists, Don't Tell Me You're One of Those, that was published in 2020. Um, in addition to the work that he's been doing, he also taught at University Park, Maryland before uh, joining where he is now. So Danny, just wanted to welcome you again to the Addy Hour podcast. Awesome. It's great to be here. Um, thanks for having me. And yeah, of course. Chemistry, uh, you know, just makes me think that things are gonna gonna go really well. So yes, <laughs> I anticipate that as well. My second guest I would like to introduce is Ima Ima, who is a visual artist and a scholar of African diaspora art, whose work considers historical and philosophical issues around the black body and cultural identity. His work has been exhibited in numerous venues across the Northeast and the US. His work is also represented in the Petrucci Foundation Collection of African American Art also in the museum collection of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His work's been featured on PBS NewsHour, New England Public Media, and other places as well. And this year, in 2023, he has actually partnered with the medical journal Biological Psychiatry to have his work appear on the cover of six issues, and that's something that I've been able to be involved in as well. So grateful for the work he's doing on many fronts. Imal has uh, someone who um, actually graduated from Columbia University in 2020 or 22. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That'd be nice. 2002. <laughs> and then earned his PhD in history of African American art at Yale, where we actually overlapped as grad students. So Imal, thanks so much for being here on the Addy Hour podcast. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you, Nee, and wonderful to be with you, Daniel. Excellent. I'm not trying to make you too young. That was just a slip of the tongue at that point. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm, I'm just going to leave that one there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I, uh, I teach a writing for art and the artist course um, at Westfield State University. And I start off the course by showing my students a paper that was heavily destroyed by one of my professors when I was in, in college. And I put it up and it said 2001. And you heard the gasps. Oh, no. 2001? <laughs> and I stopped it. <laughs> so, yes, I, I am that old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We got that gray going. Danny, somehow you're, you're keeping, you're, you're avoiding that so far. So I'm impressed. Yeah, I, I graduated undergrad in 08. So I got a few years. Uh, all right. You got some time. <laughs> I'm hoping I follow my other, my older brother's aging patterns. So yeah, he's, he looks 35 still. Oh my goodness. Well, if you learn some secrets, pass them along. <laughs> So just to jump in, as my listeners know, I often just like to do a check-in. I appreciate you all kind of sharing some of those stories already, but just to see how you all are doing at this point in 2023 um, with everything that you're doing on campus, everything we're navigating as a society. So Danny, if we can actually start with you, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I'm doing really well. Um, professionally, I have a few things that I'm working on um, and hope to finish up a couple of them um, during my sabbatical in 2024. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I've got something coming out on political rhetoric. I've got something coming out on race and interpersonal um, interactions. Um, and maybe a group processes thing coming out too. Um, really excited about that. I've got some student collaboration going on as well. Um, also putting together my tenure portfolio here. So it's quite yeah. a hectic time. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm um, looking forward to getting all those projects off the desk during the sabbatical and 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 out. Um, it's 
So everything there is good. My family is great. Um, like, you know, soccer is a big part of my life because of mm -hmm. my son. Um, he's awesome. Shout out to Friends United, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so everything there is 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 just really good. Um, just chugging along, trying to trying to, like you said, get this work out. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Definitely appreciate you sharing that. And not surprised that you've got your hands in so many things with so many projects going on. Just from what I know of you, so that's encouraging yep, to hear yep. as well. Hard for me to say no. <laughs> Thanks for asking, though. Of course, Yuma. What about you? Yeah, we're plagued by the same demons in terms of an inability to say no. Um, I, I thought I had, I thought I had shaved down what I was going to be doing for, you know, about a year ago, I canceled a bunch of things. People were very upset and I am still overwhelmed. There's so much going on right now. Um, I'm already planning out into 2024. So this is going to be interesting. I, um, just on the heels of, uh, the opening of, um, the first major comprehensive solo exhibition of my studio projects, um, uh, Benediction and in his name. And um, that, that, that exhibition is titled The Hope of Radiance at, um, mm. at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in Pittsburgh. It's just, it is, it is a stellar exhibition. It, it, um, it uh, the, the installation is exquisite. I, it's way beyond what I expected it to be. Wow. Um, and so that's very exciting. Um, I just curated a group show that is up at Westfield State University uh, um, titled Something Extraordinary um, and uh, uh, a visual review of story as timeless. So there are eight African diaspora artists mm. um, that I've brought together to have a conversation about story um, with their artwork. And it's, it's a very expressive, amazing exhibition. The artists are all very excited to be a part of it. And I'm currently putting together a group show uh, that will involve myself. And I think it's six other people now, but the, the it's called The Miracle Machine. It's gonna be in the fall and we don't know what it is we're doing. There's a musician, there's three, four artists. Wow. Someone said the title should be, you know, four artists, a musician and, and, and a poet walk into a gap. We don't know <laughs> what we're going to create. And so UMass Amherst is very excited. We're just going to, it's going to be like an incubator think tank space that will grow over the course of the fall semester. So um, anxiety, because I don't know exactly what will come of it, but that's mm -hmm. where we are right now. So um, other things, but I'll stop there. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing that honestly as well. I mean, even as we're, you know, for those who are listening, you know, talking on screen, I'm, you know, thinking about the overlap between obviously we do work in different sectors, but three black men on the screen in academia talking about taking on lots of different things, trying to make impact. So there's lots of different directions that we could go, but I definitely appreciate how you all are, have been honest about that. And, you know, tenure package coming up, all these art exhibitions coming up, playing in 2024. I mean, there's so many aspects that I can relate to on that as well, just in terms of things that we've been doing and how far in advance we have to plan, things we have to say no to in order to say yes elsewhere. And so I think even that sub-conversation is, is constructive uh, for listeners as we just think about how we navigate in these different spaces. Uh, but even before we get to that, because I know you've both talked about your work a little bit, I was just going to have you all talk about your journey into your academic professions too, especially as Black men and then as we also think about this topic of Black bodies. So Emil, why don't we start with you? How did you actually get into this work in the first place? Oh, um, if there's I've, a short version, <laughs> there may not be. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been an artist. Um, I was uh, very fortunate. Um, I'm product of a of a divorced family, my, my divorced home. That's a part of my story. Mm -hmm. um, my two um, Nigerian parents. Um, that's a part of my story too. And and so there's there's the when I came to New York to live with my mom. And I began to um, really, really jump into the art, my art, the art scene. Um, I, I realized that I wanted to go into this as a, as a, as a, as a, as, a, as an area. Mm -hmm. And um, she encouraged me. So I went to the high school of art and design. And um, by the time I graduated, I knew I wanted to go into an academic space that where art wasn't what I was focusing on necessarily. So I went to Columbia, and I was an art historian there. And the the field of art history. Um, allowed me the chance to dive into research 
which is what I really, really wanted to do on some level, but mm -hmm. I never stopped making art. And so it was always very, very confusing to um, the institutions that I've been a part of, including the one I'm at now, where I'm an art historian. I don't teach studio art courses. Um, how I navigate between the spaces of art making and um, art interpretation. And I think that there has been this way that people have wanted to place me into a box, especially mm. as a Black man. You can't be a creator and an interpreter. You mm. can't be both. And I'm like, yes, I can. <laughs> White folks do this all the time. Mm. They can be curators. They curate their own spaces. They, But there's something about um, the way I present. Mm. And I think it has a lot to do with my big Black maleness that causes people to want to put me in a particular box. They, they didn't like it at Columbia. They definitely didn't like it at Yale. And, um, and at Westfield, I think they've embraced it because they've seen what can come from it. Mm. Um, uh, in real time, they've seen it. And so this is a space that I'm still trying to figure out. It, yeah. I'm being a very bad art historian. I'm not doing a lot of writing right now, but the work that I'm doing is certainly contributing to the field. And so um, this is where I am when I speak to um, other students, when I speak to students mm -hmm. um, and other people who are thinking about diving into art, they're like, well, how did you do this? And how is it like, well, this is the pathway that allowed me to, uh, this is the pathway I chose to be a researcher and to do art, not art on the side, mm -hmm. uh, but art as really the center, um, the creation process as the center of my research. Um, and it's informed everything. Wow. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that honestly too. I mean, it's just from you know kind of childhood on. There's a lot we'll definitely come back to and unpack there um, mm -hmm. that you've you've pulled out. But just before we do that, just want to jump to Danny real quick and uh, just hear your story too about you know how you've gotten into this this academic endeavor across so many different uh, aspects of sociology. Um, a lot of my own personal interests, a lot of timing, and a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll go back. Um, my parents had. Uh, different religions. Uh, neither one of them was particularly convicted. Neither one of them ever took me to e either place of worship ever. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up without a conception of God. Okay. Time when that was being an atheist, let alone like never having be believed in God was seen as very strange. Um, so that was always something that I liked reading about and mm. stuff like that. So I had that one interest um, at the same time, my parents were also, um, my mom's Jewish, my dad's black. Um, and so there was always really interesting racial dynamics. Mm -hmm. I grew up in an all black neighborhood. My mom was the only white person in the neighborhood. Wow. So I always had lots of interesting wow. Wow. things happening about race. And then, um, uh, my mom was born in the forties. So she was raised at a time when being Jewish wasn't all the way encompassed into whiteness yet. Mm. And she, you know, later she accepted that she was white but up until like the 70s she told me she fought it and um oh, you know God. so lots of interesting things there um and so I just always wanted to inter you know explore the intersections of a lot of those things mm. yeah. um, and uh you know I was one of the kids that would you know skip school sometimes to go to the library because I was really focused on on learning about these things so I was reading philosophy books and all that at a really early age had aspirations to be a philosopher actually got to Rutgers I went there because at the time it was the number one uh, philosophy uh, program in the world or maybe tied with Oxford and took 16 or 17 philosophy classes loved wow. my professors and was the only black kid in every mm. single class except for yeah. in and as I started reading the stuff, I was like, man, this is really stodgy. I don't, there were a bunch of issues I had with it. Mm -hmm. So right at the end of my undergrad career, I had a bunch of professors come to me and this, you know, this was lucky for me. They said, we think you have a lot of potential. Um, have you ever considered these other tangential sort of, of, of careers or, or um, where you want to go? And they suggested public policy. Um, I actually had one put me in touch with Cornell West who talked to me and we developed something that I could have possibly done. Uh, Personal circumstances led me back to, to Maryland and their, their sociology program really embraced me. Mm. Um, 
and uh, something like Emo said, um, about 6'1", like 215. And I literally had some of the Black professors at Maryland, and this was a really important part of my life come to mm-hmm. me. You need to know and walk around here the way you do and you dress the way you do, that it, it people are going to see it a certain way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be good or bad, but you need to be conscious of it so you can operate within these bounds and get to where you need to go. Um, Patricia Hill, Dr. Patricia Hill Collins is one of those people, uh, Dr. Chris Marsh, uh, who just wrote a book on the black middle class called Love Jones was one of those people, uh, Dr. Rashawn Ray. So just, just having people fall into my life at the right mm. times. Mm. Um, and then as soon as I got in the classroom, I loved it. Um, I could do and say so many things that I thought were valuable um, to me in the class and, and just since I TA'd my first class, I was like, I think this is such mm-hmm. a worthwhile existence to 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 be a professor, to engage in work that will eventually trickle into classrooms and and influence, you know, what people read, what people think. Um, and so yeah, it was it was sort of just a path that just sort of happened before me. And I, mm-hmm. I just Yeah, I definitely appreciate you sharing that story. I mean, I think a lot of people just, you know, and hearing that will just be able to gain insight and maybe even understand that they didn't have before just you know because sometimes I know for students when they walk into our classrooms or see us in different settings they don't know the journey to get there so oh, it, all, it just helps to yeah they're all so much better high school students than I yeah. were um or almost all of them at least and yeah which which is scary great in places now, but yeah <laughs> yeah so again just appreciate you you both sharing that I mean I know we we're going to talk a little bit about um Black bias representation in art and society, but just with what you both mentioned, I just wanted to lean in a little bit to like your own experience as black men. Like what are what are some of the things, because I know you both talked about people kind of prepping you for that in some ways or things that you saw. What are things that surprised you in your experience and kind of how have you navigated to thrive um, in a sense? Dan, maybe we'll reverse it and start with you this time. Um, So again, some of the things that, surprised me were just what was normal to me was not you know acceptable was not within the bounds of what people were looking for and definitely not what people expected like I said I almost always went to schools that were 75 80 percent black um even when I was in like really advanced programs and so being smart being articulate those things were not surprising Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I get to to college and people are offended that I'm raising my hand so much and that I have opinions and that, my God, he actually knows the answer before everybody else. And I I was not ready Mm. for that. Um, And so I definitely needed people to um, help me out. Um, Again, understanding that, navigating that, not letting that bother me. Um, And, you know, not to, because those, those are, really good and important qualities for, yeah. for a professor being in academia and not to let those qualities, you know, sort of be drained out or beaten out of me. Yeah. Um, so again, now that I know what I know as a sociologist, I shouldn't have been surprised by those things <laughs> when I was, you know, 17, 18 years yeah. old. I had only had the experiences that I had uh, growing up in, in Prince George's County. Like I just showed my, my classes now, we're talking about contemporary segregation. Mm-hmm. I live where my kids go to school, PG County. Uh, the school system has 120,000 kids, only 3% white, right? And so mm-hmm. it's it, that is the kind of experience that I had, uh, basically. And then again, going to these PWI big mm-hmm. states, it was it was something that I, I needed help with. And like, like I said, I, I've just been lucky to have people there um, for me. Yeah. Just to follow up a little bit on that, how and you talked about this a little bit, but how are you uh, helping or informing or guiding your students in that process too, even as you think about your own experience, the knowledge you have as a sociologist and, and paying it forward, so to speak? Um, multiple things. Um, so one, I, I, and sometimes they ask me, um, but I generally dress like this every day, like mm-hmm. in, in the, not awful, but like in a way where I'm like living my authentic black yeah. body. Yeah. Uh, to show them that, you know, maybe some of these stereotypes aren't right. And, you know, uh, I think sort of just living that every day. I know like Jody Armour and Cornell West wear their afros. Mm-hmm. 
for the same sort of uh, reason. Like uh, Jody Armour says, it's his hoodie, right? Um, and so I try to live it. And I also, um, you know, through my experiences, try to, and I have, I've been all over different demographics because of, of my parents, mm -hmm. um, that I can sort of translate a lot of what I have learned across different um, spaces. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I try to do um, in the classroom is bridge any gaps, use myself as a foil, um, so we can just like have a medium to to talk about these issues. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I, like I said, I, I um, really try to use that that strength in in terms mm. of across uh, different groups. Yeah, that's that's really good. Definitely powerful. Ima, anything you want to add, either to answer the question about your own navigation or even riff off of anything that Danny? Yeah, I was just gonna up. I was gonna mention the the notion of serendipity or luck or like there's, you know, for for all the for all of the intelligence that people have claimed I have, or that I have thought that I may have had, um, I think so, so much of my arrival at where I'm at has come from just the kindness of just good people, people mm. who, people who decided to care mm. at a particular time. The idea that I've arrived where I'm at by myself, um is uh it's, it's a false one and so i'm all, i always find it really interesting when i encounter you go to a conference or you speak to people and it's almost like they've they've prepared to be doctor so and so for so long that um uh you get a sense that the phone going off for example in the middle of a of a conversation like this would be catastrophic right um and i've just never been able to arrive at this place mm. where um where i take myself so seriously um that uh that i lose my sense of humanity you know mm. and i think that's what my students connect with the most um i will sometimes just like this in class and sometimes i'm wearing a t-shirt because i'm going i'm coming to class from the studio and i'm going mm. back studio to work and I tell them what I'm working on I'm like I'm working on this drawing and it's kicking my butt right now you know um that's why there's charcoal on my shirt mm -hmm. um but when I when I was first uh when I first came in as a professor in 2009 um I thought I was supposed to be wearing blazers or a suit or I just had this feeling that that um because I'm, I'm I teach at a predominantly white institution and there was a sense that it was my part of my job or burden was to make it clear that that I'm worthy of this, that mm. as a black person, I can do this. And um, and to demonstrate to the white kids in my class that I really understand my field and to demonstrate to my department that I was going to do this well. Now. Everybody can see, everybody could see and can continue to see now that the level, the level and the quality of work I was bringing was way beyond what they were even asking for. Mm -hmm. But it was so hard for me to accept it um, because there was this feeling that I'm, I'm just above water. I'm not actually there. And at any given time, um, a wave, could, a, a road wave could come over and just drown me. So when I first got into Columbia University um, from the High School of Art and Design, it was a really, really big deal for my high school. Um, I was waitlisted at Harvard. That was a huge deal, you know, and I just knew that they'd made a mistake. In fact, the first two to four, I'll say two months of my time at Columbia University, in my dorm room, I waited. I waited for mm. notification for from the head of whoever to say, we made a mistake. Mm. You're not supposed to be here. Because I was struggling when I first got there. I was stumbling through these classes. I was trying to figure out who I was in mm -hmm. all this sea of white folks. And the few Black people that were at school were trying to figure out who they were too and and there's insecurity and there are weird things that are said because of that and it's like I can look back on it now and be like oh god we were all so young and stupid and just trying to figure things out but 
it still haunts me mm. some of what I went through that first semester until I figured out how to do undergrad. Mm-hmm. And then I, when I got to Yale, it was even worse. It was mm-hmm. even worse because this thing that we study called art, art history, this thing that we study, which for me is not just a thing to study. I live it. I roll around in charcoal and paint. This is what I do for fun, right? Mm-hmm. It had become so dry and philosophical. And here I am, big black me in the class, and they're asking me a question about the thing we just read. And I'm like, did we all read the same thing? Mm. (laughs) Um, Because my take was so violently different. Mm. Um, And the way I spoke was so casual. And I'm like, this is our, I do this every day. Like, no, I I don't care if you're using big words. Like, Mm. I do this every day. I know this. And I, I just, it took me such a long time to understand that um, I was just coming from a completely different worldview from most of the people at these institutions. Mm-hmm. And that it wasn't my job to change my worldview. It was my job to just shine in the way that I could mm-hmm. myself. But it took a while. It took yeah. a while. I wish I could say that it was with great confidence mm-hmm. that I walked through the halls of these institutions. But um, even now, I, I shudder as I mm. remember. I shudder wow. as I remember. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that's real. And I know that people listening, there's going to be lots of folks that are going to be able to relate to that too. And then also, in a sense, even get encouragement from you sharing the challenges to know that, okay, if they're navigating through that, it's not just them. Because like, I mean, yeah, even as yeah. you describe that, there's yeah. so much isolation and how you just describe that, even though you saw other people navigating those same pieces in isolated pods and i know my mental health piece is coming out too but that's like that's the first thing that came to mind as you were talking definitely i don't definitely. think people talk about the failures enough yeah. and i don't think people i, I when i say people i mean in general academics but i think that black academics in particular mm. should grow more comfortable discussing mm. the failures because these spaces haven't gotten any easier Mm-hmm. for the next generation of, of black and brown people they mm-hmm. haven't become easier mm-hmm. we're dealing with the same yeah. things yeah right and um and so the idea of not sharing my gosh one of the things i share with my students is i tell them if you you know if you do well this semester remind me at close the end of the semester i will tell you my how i almost got kicked out of yale story you know about how the paper that i the papers that i submitted were so not up to par because of all of my anxiety Mm. that they almost threw me out. I Mm. shared this conversation openly with anyone who will listen that I graduated, got my PhD and I'm doing very well, but they almost threw me out. Mm. They almost threw me out because I was looking for myself and I, I, it took me so long to figure out who I was at that school. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm so comfortable sharing that. I've seen other scholars cringe when I talk about it. I'm like, why are you cringing? It's my story. Yeah. yeah. And somebody needs this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Dan, anything you want to comment on either you know, like from your own experience or your, um, your lens? Cause you talked about that too. Like now what you know, as a sociologist, how that also impacted you looking back and thinking about, okay, that's why I was struggling here or navigating this way. Any thoughts in um, general? For sure. Um, and again, one, it was just like my my background was very different. Like um both of my brothers were were street dudes, had been mm-hmm. in jail a lot. And um like those are still part of my mm-hmm. influences. And um yeah, it just I have something specific actually. Okay, um, yeah. So and again, it has to do with with mannerisms and what's normalized and what's taught. So, um, again, grew up talking, conversing a certain way. And for whatever reason, again, maybe it's because of of where I went to school, never had grammar in any level of school, not in Mm. third grade, not in fifth grade, not in ninth grade, not in 12th grade, never, never. Right. So I'm in all these AP language classes in high school and like, I write well, so I'm getting like B's, but I'm always getting my papers all marked up and whatnot. Um, And then I get to college and the compository writing um, or expository writing, I forget what the name of the class was. Um, I'm getting really good grades in that. And uh, my teacher 
is really impressed with the way that I can interpret passages and all mm -hmm. of that. And she even uh, assigns me to help a couple students in the class that are struggling. And then we take a final mm -hmm. in that class, which isn't graded by the professor, but graded by the a random grad student in the English department. And it's graded very technically. And I failed that final. First semester, freshman year. And I had all A's in other classes. So I was like, I can do this. Mm. But it was this thing that I was never taught. And combined with the fact that how I normally talk and normally write is, is culturally alien to a lot of mm -hmm. those people that I ended up failing that class. And that, you know, again, my, my mom was really supportive of me in that. My dad was really supportive of me. My other professors were really supportive of me um, to not let that get me down. Um, mm -hmm. But my second semester, I had to repeat a class, right? And I still ended up graduating with honors in philosophy and sociology. Um, but those trials are real. And a lot of mm -hmm. times you just aren't prepared for them. And you can't know unless you have somebody who has the, the experience and knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can't really know that you're not prepared for for certain spaces, and so mm. oh, you found. Oh, wow. <laughs> got a, I got an A in the class the second time. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's really that's really pointed. But I, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, but it just speaks to the whole that whole meritocracy. Yeah. Commentary that I know a lot of people have been having that conversation. Some might hear us and say, "Oh, we're hearing this again," but I still think it's sometimes people just don't want to admit that's because you know that you know you had another ta everything shifted at the last minute and right. someone from the outside could be like oh well he just didn't right. earn the same x y and z as everybody else ignoring the fact of what you were exposed to early on how that impacts you in that situation and how the other professor was giving you feedback like all of that and then how that's just used to kind of you know keep people in their place for lack of a better word so yeah yeah, I still can barely use a comma or semicolon. <laughs> yeah. Drop them in there haphazardly and let editors fix it now. But. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, somebody needs to hear that. Somebody's mm -hmm. gonna need to hear what you just said because yeah. um yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a it's I wish that I could look back on all of these experiences with fondness, but mm. there was so much of it that was uphill fighting. Mm. um for me and um and so like <clears throat> I uh but I do look at my undergraduate experiences with with fondness because like I said there were people who chose to just be kind mm. they saw a diamond in the rough and so it but it was uh, I, I bring this up because it was those decisions that mm -hmm. certain people made you yeah. know um Adam Rothman who was at that time a PhD oh. student teaching a course and he's doing big things now um but like he pulled me aside he's like Ima, when i see an a I'll, I'll give you one here's what you need to do and um a lot of my issue was scaling back how much i was saying because mm. i was able to get to the crux of my arguments much faster with shorter papers there were two different professors that pulled me aside and said oh god you're doing this all wrong you wrote seven pages here but the last four pages were, were were brilliant. The first two made no sense. And so like someone had to teach yeah. me how to harness what they all said was a gift for writing. They all said, no, 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 no. You're one of the best writers we've ever seen at your at this stage. I'm like, I am? But yes. Then why don't I have an A? Because this is a terrible paper. But we can see what you can do. Mm -hmm. And so pulling me aside and showing me line by line. But it took time. It took time. And, and so now as a professor, uh, it, I remember that. I remind mm -hmm. myself of that and my students. I show them my old papers. And I sit with the ones who really want to know. Mm -hmm. And we go through it line by line um, until we understand, you know, how we can be better you mm. know um but I, I can't this for anybody who would say you know oh you know well that, that has nothing to do with race you're making everything about race like why are you talking about race why would you bring up race in this kind of a, in, instance because race was such a big part of it mm -hmm. um 
the fear of speaking in those white spaces uh, because you felt like anything you said would represent your entire race. You know, having certain professors pull me aside and say, Ima, you've been really quiet in class lately. Why? And not being able to admit that mm -hmm. I heard two white girls snickering in the corner when I was speaking and immediately thought that I sounded stupid. The professors had to find ways to get me to speak. And then once I once I was open, it was like it was it was over, you know, but it, 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 race is so much a part still mm -hmm. um, of, of um, this college experience, um, especially for uh, for. Um, for, for black men in, in schools such as these. Yeah. Yeah. Really well said. And I appreciate again, just how open you are with your students too. And just kind of taking them on that journey. Danny, you look like you're going to reflect on something. Oh, no, I, I just really agreed with what he said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just try to employ a bunch of the similar practices. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. There are these moments, I know we're talking about black bodies and, or we will, or, or we already are. And, there were these, there were, I don't remember every moment of my time at these institutions, um, but there are a couple that stand out to me. And there was one when I was at Yale in the, the, in the music, the music library is easily one of the most extraordinary, beautiful things ever constructed. It's just such a beautiful space, you know? So I would just go in there sometimes and just sit there, you know? Um, and, 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 and I remember, um, and, and there were these moments where I would completely forget who I was in this space. And it was one particular time I was walking by in there, just, I greeted somebody really warmly and they just looked me up and down. And, um, and I, um, <laughs> I was like, okay. And then I, I went to the bathroom and I caught my reflection. Mm. I'm seeing this Big black, always sweaty. There's a sweat on my <laughs> book bag, and I'm just like, "Damn, I forgot." I I, I remember that moment wow. when I was I, I saw myself in the mirror, and I'm like, "Damn, I forgot." Like, why would anybody not greet me or be or smile? You know, mm. and and I was just reminded in that space. It's like, it's like Negro. This ain't your space. You know, this is how I felt there. Mm. And, um, I had a few moments like that, but this is one that just I'm reminded of. It, it's not that it was all gloom and doom. I had mm -hmm. some wonderful things that happened in these institutions to, there. Mm -hmm. um, in undergrad, Sudhir Venkatesh, uh, I realized that my way into um, art history, my way into art history as a study, what, okay, my way into research of art history happened through ethnography, happened through mm. sociology. Sudhir <laughs> Venkatesh's class um, opened up my whole worldview. Like, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. So I could study African and African-American artists as a sociological project. And he had me do an independent study with him. Mm. It's not, not easy. Um, but he walked me through that mm. slowly, methodically, carefully, um, and brought me to this place where I could begin to understand how art history and sociology and archaeology and, and and all of these things are very very they're not as divided as you would think mm -hmm. depending on what it is you're trying to study as an Africanist in art history these things are all very very connected and so I had good moments mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. want to make it clear that the race part is not something that's easily um uh divorceable yeah from it's part of it yeah well so I want, I'll add one real quick thing and that mm -hmm. is um, both of us went to, went to undergrad, like, at like the peak of like colorblindness in this mm. system. We weren't supposed to talk about those things, right? Mm. Like that's when they were like, I'll oh, get the chip off your shoulder or whatever. Um, I think there's now a little more space for talking about those sorts of experiences. Um, but again, like 15, 20 years ago, um, there, there really wasn't, um, so, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Just to, I mean, just to pick up on that a little bit, too, because the one thing we were going to talk about is just like how you all think about these topics in your current roles, both what you do in the classroom and like how it impacts society. So, Danny, I was just going to follow up with you. Like, how does that because you I know we've talked a lot about, you know, the wealth gap pieces and some of those other things and how you introduce your students to those concepts. So how do you think about 
and maybe this isn't exactly what you do, but how you think about the concept of a black body, even as you're teaching all these different classes on all these intersecting topics and how you kind of pass that on to your students to really make sure they catch the realities. Right, good. Um, one of the things I try to drive home across all of the different subjects that we cover is that there is so much evidence that there is a social and racial hierarchy in this country. Mm -hmm. um, Blacks, the most consistent thing is that Black people are at the bottom, right? And so I try to, depending on what um, we're covering that week or whatever, relate something to that, right? And so, um, like today we were talking about um, implicit bias, right? And to literally show um, an experiment done of, you know, here's a white kid acting this way in a park, here's a black kid acting this way in a park. What are the reactions of the, the society around gonna be? Mm -hmm. The way that black bodies are treated in each and every single, you know, scenario for the most part is different and almost always qualitatively worse, mm -hmm. right? There are some times where I show them stuff and they they think it's white guilt and that not necessarily worse or better, but most of the time they think that it's qualitatively um, worse. And so that's, that's what I try to sort of get across, right? Um, and even in that, that one specific video, right? It, it just debunks so many stereotypes that white people are supposed to be scared of these like, wild and thugs or whatever right mm -hmm. um when in reality it's almost always the black body that's put in jeopardy by acting any way outside of the norm doing something deviant that um a white kid is allowed individuality um and not mm -hmm. wanted about those things that that black bodies are often in really vulnerable really vulnerable positions and often in really vulnerable positions where authority figures have the ability to do something to them, mm -hmm. right? Spend them from school, arrest them, put them in jail, right? These sorts of things. Um, and that just cumulatively, it adds up to so much, right? It, it adds up to stress. It adds up to lower life expectancy. It adds up to um, you know, building up all these stereotypes about Black deviance and criminality when it's treated different from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I insert bodies so they can, like, really understand and empathize rather than just see a bunch of numbers. Like, when mm -hmm. I show the numbers on the wealth disparity, they don't want to believe it. Mm. The wealth disparity is 10x. It's been 10x for 50, 60 years. I'll give them a quiz. They don't want to, they just don't want to know. They'll still put two times or four times, wow. right? Um, but when I actually am able to get them to visualize um, wow. bodies or hypothetical people, it, it clicks better. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still taking that in. Just uh, thank you get it wrong on the test because I refuse to hear it. Mm -hmm. Jeez. And it's been very consistent. That one question, especially wow. across. It's very telling. Yeah. It's very, very telling. It says it all. Mm. It says it all. Okay. I, um, on my end, uh, you know, that, I mean, they're the courses I teach, but they're also the special projects that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and just by way of this conversation we're having about Black bodies, there was one that I, I did at Westfield State University, which is, like I said, a predominantly white school. And I should tell you that I did, here's how I arrived at this project. It's a project titled 17 Years Boy. And um, I, I still don't know what that project was, and I'm glad it's over, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, but before that project started, here's what had happened, all right? Um, Donald Trump had recently been inaugurated as president. Mm -hmm. You can determine at another time if any of the following things were connected to him. Um, there was this huge Charlottesville, you know, incident. Um, it was brought, up, brought upon by riots, by um, white nationalists and white supremacists, and there was a whole lot of 
a whole lot of wickedness that looked white there, okay, um, um, in Charlottesville, and, 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 and people died. One person died, two cops died, three people died of a leaf net and that. Um, so that had happened. Mm -hmm. Someone in my church, a church I no longer attend, predominantly white church, white evangelical church, um, had posted a noose to his Facebook page, public. Um, he says in response to Black Lives Matters and all of a sudden, because treason, they'll say, you know, they're, they're you know, you know, no, 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 not lynching. Traditional way of, you know, treasonous would be, so it's a news, you know, well, yeah, we don't have to Black people with news, but that's not what I meant. So mm -hmm. he posted that to his Facebook page. Um, I was... I won't go into that story, but a number of things happened and didn't happen as a result mm. of that. Mm. Um, and then school starts. And mm. two weeks into school starting, um, uh, st students are, uh, Black students are accosted with um, racist language written on their, on their doors, nigger go home, mm. um, or niggers live here, whatever it was. It sounded very, very 60s. It's really interesting how the language hasn't changed much. So. <laughs> Um, you know, and so all of these things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people planning marches because of the racist incidents at Westfield State. There are people, there were rape threats to black black girls that, that, that were there. All kinds of things were happening. That, that semester in particular was hot, but it wasn't just at Westfield State. It was happening around the United States mm -hmm. okay, at a number of different institutions. And so... I decided to have a project that would look at the life and death of Trayvon Martin. Um, because people were asking, are you going to be at this? Are you going to be at this protest? Are you going to be at this? I'm like, I, everybody leave me alone. You all go ahead and do your marching, whatever's going to make you feel better. Um, but I'm going to do what artists do. Mm -hmm. We make things. And so I brought together, it was a collaborative project that involves the, um, the, the, the 17 hour long it took four days to do painting mm. of a portrait of Trayvon Martin that was destroyed at the 17th hour. Nobody wow. knew it was going to be destroyed. It was an ex extremely emotional mm. um, work of art. Um, and many people are still wondering what happened. People were asking, well, why is he doing this? The, the people who were criticizing it were like, this doesn't make any sense. Trayvon, that, was, that was like six years ago. But it was weird. In the room that I constructed, you could hear the sounds of the Zimmerman trial. Like that was playing. So mm -hmm. it was like you were walking into a time warp mm -hmm. where you were six years prior. We were all living in that moment where this boy who was brutalized um, was not was dragged through the Zimmerman trial. It became the Trayvon Martin trial. We all lived through that mm -hmm. about how he could be killed twice, you know? And so there was this conversation about Black bodies and the things that happened to us and why, you know, graffiti on doors such as nigger go home or niggers live here in then 2017, 2018, really you can draw a line to it. Mm -hmm. And it's a national one. And it's a local one. And um, it confused a lot of people. A lot of people felt good that it was happening as well. Um, and I was completely devastated when a very, very high ranking person at the school, when it was all done, came and said, this, is, this has just been amazing. When are you going to do it again? <laughs> and I, wow. I looked at him. Here we had put together art, the music department had come together, the English department, there were songs. It was a very emotional thing in commemoration of Trayvon Martin, but also of 17 other boys over the past century, starting from 1915, mm -hmm. who had had things like this done. So it was like, it was a, a, a shrine. Mm -hmm. in and this man came to me and said, please, Imam, we need to do more of this. When are you going to do this again? And I was like, I don't know. Let's see. The next, the, the next boy is going to be killed next week. Let's, let's put it together again. It was very odd mm. and missing the mark, mm -hmm. you know? And so there is this way that I, I can imagine that Danny has, has poured himself out into a lecture or into a work of a piece of writing um, or, or into a talk um, only to have this, the point just. Oh, yeah just gone mm. and you wonder 
Are you shouting into a void that just consumes what it is you're saying? It, 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 is there any way that change happens? Is what I'm doing, does it actually move the, the, the does, it, does it move anything? Mm. You know? And that's something that I wonder often. I mean, I'm still, when I get off, when I'm done with you guys, I'm, I'm going, I'm working on the next thing because mm-hmm. the conversation has to continue. Mm-hmm. But there is this fear sometimes that, um, people are seeing the artistry and missing the point. Mm. That worries me. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've had a number of instances like that. Um, and yeah, it, is, it is tough to deal with. Um, I would say that like, that's where like individual emails or something, like maybe a text from a student, even if mm. it's a couple of years later, be like, I get it now, um, are really valuable um, resources to, you know, keep you going. Yep. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's sobering, but like those little pieces, those little things, like you said, make a huge difference. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Well, one thing just to, as a last pivot, I'm curious, and now I'm really curious, just the way this conversation has gone, I'm curious what keeps you all going? Like what gives you hope in what you're doing? Because I mean, we've talked about, I mean, there's obviously the the passion for the craft that you have, but there's also the challenges and you've done a nice job of kind of laying out that reality. But just, and I'm sure our listeners are curious too, like why are you all still doing this work? What what keeps you moving besides those texts and, the, and those messages? Dan, you want to start? It's the it's not the huge academia checks either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> one thing oh, is the <laughs> collective laughter of academics. Of course. <laughs> oh god. We're relatively okay, but we we're, we're not buying any uh, NFL franchise anytime. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so there are like real world tangible things that give me hope, right? I've seen since I've started doing my work uh, with atheists, specifically Black atheists, Mm. there has been some stigma lifted around that. And that, Mm. especially within the Black community, I've seen some of that stigma lifted. And I think even at least as importantly, some of that more secular public figure um, Black history reclaimed. so I, in, um, in terms of seeing more black faculty and certain institutions really trying to live up to ideals, I, I do have hope from those things. Um, and so I try to, to lean into that, that, um, you know, that there is hope to fix the things that have been really slow, right? Mm-hmm. Like actual fixing or narrowing of of racial disparities that has been slow going if if no going at all right mm. the wealth disparity home ownership gap those things are bigger than when dr king spoke in 1963 mm. um but the progress that i see on the interpersonal side again lends me to just just want to keep chopping and hope that we can have enough cross-cultural understandings and eventually some paradigm shifts that lead to places where we start to see outcomes being more equal. We start to see um, the qualitative treatment of different groups being much more equal, much less disparate. Mm. And so that's, that's really the world that I'm hoping for. I think that it's achievable. I've seen individuals make the change. Um, so that's what gives me hope. The thing that, you know, scares me is um, just just how incentivized racism has become mm. um, on the right wing, especially. Um, and that that is a, a very strong competing force to what I want to see. Um, and it has a lot of money and it has a lot of power and it has a lot of structural things going for it in terms of minoritarian government prevailing quite a bit in this country. Um, and so, yeah, um, I hope that makes sense, right? Yeah, I, I've got definitely. to overcome that obstacle because of the things that I've seen um, within people, especially. Um, mm. Again, some institutions, but the, the institutions have been very slow to, to change in this society. Yeah. 
No, I definitely appreciate that perspective. I mean, as I'm reflecting on what you're saying, it actually reminds me of the story you were talking about with the wealth gap and how you just, you know, you're continuing because that's a, in a microcosm. The students might not be seeing it at first. You package it in a different way. Eventually they catch it. And just right. hearing you talk about that on the societal level in terms of stigma for black atheists or other types of things that are moving at the individual level, institutionally, that gives me hope hearing you say that because I know that's a tension that I feel often, especially I know even in this podcast, like, okay, or what am I doing in the lab? What am I doing with students? Is it making a little difference here? Is it making a difference society wide? Where, where, and that's this almost, it almost sounds too selfish in a sense, because it's almost as if I'm saying, where am I feeling like I'm actually making an impact in someone's life or in someone's lives or in society? So to kind of hear you package that for me is also just really helpful. It reminds me of something I, I said to my wife um, when about two or three weeks ago, there was the fallout of Beyonce not winning the a Grammy. I'm, I don't keep up with the awards, so, but I think it was a Grammy. And I said to her, well, I don't, I didn't listen to that album, but she did. I heard it in the back. <laughs> it was okay. Um, but I said to her 30 years ago, we, we wouldn't have even had a public mm. discussion about should a black woman have won a Grammy. Yeah. So we need to acknowledge what's, what's racist, what kind of bias are going on over there, but also that there's hope because mm. we are in a different space than we, we used to be. That's yeah. True. That's good perspective. I'm going to give you the last word. My hope is in the relationships that um, that I'm forming with, I think, some of the most extraordinary people um, as I create um, and as I deal with the various themes, you know, um, in my work as an artist, as a professor, and just as, as, a, as a human being. So the relationships bring hope for me. Um, I'm not working in a vacuum. Things are happening. The world is moving. Um, uh, and what I do as an artist is just another offering. Um, it's another offering and an opening for a conversation. Um, I, I, I sometimes find it easier to deal with my emotions around a series of things, you know, um, through the avenue of art. And what I, what I like about it is that I, I don't always know what I'm doing. In fact, most of the time, I don't. I don't do sketches before I do the final work. I just, it comes out as a unit. It's how I work. Um, and, and it's pretty honest when it does. It's perhaps more honest. I'm more honest in line than I am um, than I am when I'm speaking. Mm. And uh, there's something childlike about, about making things, starting mm. nothing and then making it. Um, there's something a little narcissistic about it. I'm deciding that that is going to be something when anybody looking at it can say there's nothing there, right? And so somewhere in that tension mm. between a God complex and a child um, wow. is the opportunity for a new kind of conversation to start. And um, because God is always making new things, um, I just don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't know mm -hmm. what it's gonna do. And there's hope in not knowing, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, we think that, you know, we think we, we think we know what the next five minutes will bring, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact is we don't. There's somewhere in there that gives me hope you know, um, that something really extraordinary could take place. Mm. Um, I think it's childlike, but I'm okay with that. In terms of being a teacher or a professor, um, it's still in the relationships. Mm. I was teaching, I, I, when I teach my art survey courses, it's a general course in, in art history. Um, I always start with Africa. I have my reasons. Um, I've never been a part of an art survey course in my training that has started with Africa. Mm -hmm. I, start, I start with Africa and, and we go through it. <laughs> and um, I have, in one of my classes, I have one, one black kid, one black, two, two black students. And this one guy, he's just, he's just sharp. He's a brilliant young man, he's a first year. And I was talking about something, I forgot, it was a video showing of some ritual or a ceremony and there were women dancing. And I was talking, I was trying to stay focused 
but I panned the room as I was giving this impassioned end of the lecture. And the smile on his face, he was just looking at the screen. It looked cartoonish. Mm. He, he was beaming ear to ear and he waited till after class to meet with me. And he's like, I don't know how to look. I'm, I'm, I'm African-American, you know, that's Africa. There's got to be some kind of genetic memory. I know those women. I know how they're moving. I get that. Like, I, I feel like I'm related to them. So he was explaining. He didn't know that I saw this big grin on his face, mm. but he was explaining how he was feeling in that moment. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be at this school right now. Mm. He needs this. And there are students like him that need this right now. And so there's hope in that for me. There's yeah. hope that I'm in the right position at the right place and time. Um, that 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 my being in this particular moment means something to the people um, who are gathered around me, um, and I'm okay with just that. Mm. It's a great juxtaposition from the the undergrad not feeling like yeah to be here to that moment giving you the exact opposite um, feeling of of I should be here and this is exactly why. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Great illustration. Wow. Well, I'm grateful to both of you. One for just the work that you all do on a daily basis. I mean, even not despite, but amidst everything that you all navigate, just to even to get to where you are, as you all shared so uh, so powerfully and eloquently, and then just the impact it's having on that generation. Definitely full circle, as Danny mentioned. So thank you to both of you for the work. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to actually be here to share this. I know listeners are going to get a lot out of this. I know I'm just anticipating there's so many things that people are going to be able to relate to or have their eyes open to at the same time or a little bit of both. So definitely appreciate what you're all doing. Hopefully this will give other people hope as well as we all try and move forward as a society. So Danny, Emil, thanks so much for being here. Definitely appreciate both of you. Awesome. Thank you. I had a blast. This was I had a blast too. <laughs>